Past ages of the world had left their scars upon the forest. The Starfall Wars had torn the lands millennia ago. On the plains below the valley, the last battle had been fought. Evil had been overthrown at the very gates of the dark city. The ancient wars were now all but forgotten. History had become legend over the course of centuries, for it is the curse of men and dwarves and elves that they forget. A great oily lake now filled the valley, surrounded by crumbled ruins. The dark city lay drowned and forgotten, lost beneath the black waters. The centuries passed, but in its sleep, evil regained its strength. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. So back in August of last year, I talked about Middle-Earth Roleplaying, a simplified version of Rolemaster that was a gateway drug for many into the wonderful world of roleplaying, especially in Europe from my experiences. However, I said at the time that Rolemaster's design was still rooted in the segmented motif that was the norm of its day. I know Rollmaster has been the subject of jokes about its complexity, but I don't think it's as complex as it appears. It just needs a little unification, even with the simplified version in Middle-Earth role-playing, although simplified might be stretching things, debatably. This brings us to Against the Dark Master, effectively a retro clone of Middle-Earth role-playing that wears its influence of high fantasy and heavy metal on its sleeve at the same time attempting to streamline aspects of Merp's design into something a little more cohesive. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Against the Dark Master, here as to refer to as VSD, is a sizable tome at 574 pages, but it doesn't seek to overwhelm the reader given the clear black-and-white design of the book and a strict adherence to its two-column format. Of particular note in the PDF version is the inclusion of hyperlinks in the table of contents and the index, something that is extremely rare even among the heavy hitters of the industry. There's definitely as many charts as I would expect, but beyond that they went out of their way to keep the navigation as pain-free as possible. More games could stand to do this, I think. Character creation is a seven-step process that will be familiar yet different to Merp and Rollmaster veterans. We'll be exploring this with a swordsman named Vermund. Now the first step is generating stats. This can be done by rolling on the random stat roll table, or distributing 50 points at a range of 0 to 25. We'll be going with the former method of a d100 roll six times, because I like to live dangerously. So we've rolled the following. 98, 93, 89, 81, 77, and 65. We'll assign these to the six stats, and after consulting the table to determine each roll's stat value, we arrive at the following as our base. Brawn 30, Swiftness 25, Fortitude 25, Wits 15, Wisdom 10, and Bearing 20. Step 2 is Kin, the game's equivalent to races. These can range from humans to elves to even trolls. Regardless of choice, each grants a starting set of modifiers to stats. Now in our case, we'll go with High Man as our kin of choice, which grants us plus 10 to Brawn and Fortitude, plus 5 to Bearing, 35 HP, plus 1 to MP, plus 5 to Toughness saves, 4 background points, and a Wealth level of 1. We also gain a plus 15 modifier in Charisma from the Imposing feature that we ended up rolling for. Step 3 is Cultures, the upbringing of the character. This may grant ranks in Skills, Outfit, passions, and a modifier to wealth level. We'll be going with seafaring in our case. Skill-wise, we gain the following ranks. One in armor, ranged, brawl, nature, acrobatics, charisma, cultures, and body. Two in blades and athletics, and three in wandering, songs, and tales. For our outfit, we gain an additional wealth level at a set of remeller armor, a falchion, and a flask of ale. Step 4 is Vocation, the equivalent to character class. Vocations provide bonuses to skills by default, but also development points to distribute on skills. We'll go with Warrior in our case. This grants us a plus 20 bonus in 5 combat skills, plus 15 in body, plus 10 in athletics and ride, and plus 5 in hunting, nature, and wandering. 
In addition, we have a set of development points in the following categories. Two in armor, five in combat, four in adventuring, two in roguery, and two in body. These are spent in a one-to-one -one basis on their associated skills. In our case, we'll have the following spread after factoring in the spread from the previous step. Blunt 1, Blades 3, Ranged 1, Pole Arms 1, Brawl 2, Athletics 3, Ride 1, Hunting 1, Nature 1, Wandering 4, Acrobatics 2, Perception 2, Charisma 1, Cultures 1, Songs and Tales 3, and Body 3. While I didn't spend any here, I should note the optional spec specialty skills within each category. These are a means of customizing non-casting vocations which are spent on develop with development points on a 1-to-2 basis, while casting vocations must spend DP on a 2-for-1 basis. The final step is backgrounds, a means of fleshing out characters based on their past. We have four background points that we gained from Kin that can be spent on major or minor tiers. We'll spend three points on the well-traveled major tier, and one point on the elven training minor tier. The former allows us to declare a safe haven is within 1d5 days travel once, and additionally, once per session we may learn of an alternative route while the party is preparing for travel. The latter background allows us access to the elven lore and spell songs spell lores as if we were a silver elf, and two free ranks in those lores, which we'll place in spell songs. Character creation has much of the strengths that I discussed in my Middle-earth role-playing review. That said, VSD's take has several advantages. Chief among them is a more clarified version of skills and backgrounds, since the latter is more point-based than role-based. That said, those who prefer a more hands-on approach to character creation won't find their approach as compatible. There's some flexibility, but it's far from freeform, especially if one chooses to multi-class. Against the Dark Master is aiming for a specific kind of net to cast, and that net is not entirely a sandbox, but it's not a set path either. Now, being a successor to the Rollmaster system, Against the Dark Master uses a Roll High D100 system. This role is modified positively by characters' skills, stats, and so on, and negatively by the role's difficulty. If the D100 roll is a natural 95 or higher, the roll explodes. If you roll a natural 5 or less, the roll implodes. Regardless, the final result is tied to one of five outcomes. A critical failure on a 4 or less, a failure on a 5 to a 74, a partial success on a 75 to 99, a success on a 100 to 174, and an outstanding success on a 175 or more. Drive can act as the extra effort resource within the game, which can be used to gain a bonus to rolls, re-rolling a roll, or even treat a roll as a natural effect. Drive points have a pool ranging from 1 to 5, and are primarily increased by acting within one's three passions, nature, allegiance, and motivation. Like in MURP, combat is a series of phases rather than a traditional initiative system, called the Tactical Round Sequence, or TRS. This is composed of up to nine phases with the GM acting first, and then the players, from first to last. These are Assessment, Action Declaration, Move, Spell A, Ranged A, Melee, Ranged B, Spell B, and other actions. Regardless, participants may perform either a full action or two half actions, with their order of resolution being based on the phase it takes place in. The difference between phases A and B is rooted in prepared and unprepared ranged weapons and spells. Attacking and defending is still a contested role. The result is compared to the relevant attack table to determine damage and possible critical levels. As much of a dirty word it has been because of overuse, VSD is a streamlined affair compared to its predecessor. However, its use of charts will either make or break some players. And while it's certainly simpler than the days of Merp, where every skill had its own chart, the game is still a race to see who hits critical first. But it wouldn't do to not cover magic, in answering the question of whether or not casting is as scub as it was back in Merp. Magic is a skill-based affair in VSD. Each type of magic has an associated skill, known as a spell lore. Each rank acquired in a spell grants a spell in that lore's paths. Now, like normal skills, spell lores are based on a stat. Spells require magic points to use, which depend on the caster's vocation. Wits for wizards, wisdom for animists, and bearing for everybody else. The spell lores available to a caster are based on the vocation, 
with each having a set of lores that they can spend development points on. Regardless, a final roll of at least 26 or more is needed to cast a spell. Higher rolls determine the minimum difficulty for the spell's target to resist its effects. Additionally, spells can be enhanced through warping, which allows a lower level spell to be cast at a higher level if the caster is of a sufficient level to do it. Magic is not without risk, however. As a roll of doubles, it causes a magical resonance effect, as the titular Dark Master takes notice of the use of magic. Higher weave spells may result in higher resonance effects in this regard. Against the Dark Master is a dense game, but not one I'd say is overly complicated. Given the game's strength of navigation, it does an exceptional job of maintaining a lower fantasy but no less heroic style of play. It'd be easy to look at it as a retro clone of Middle-earth role-playing, but I feel that alone does it a disservice. I'd say in a weird way it has some similarities with Shadow of the Demon Lord in terms of its abilities to create a sandbox based on certain bullet points for the table to fill in. In fact, given the musical influence with both of them, you could say that Shadow of the Demon Lord is death metal, whereas Versus the Dark Master is power metal. That said, the tables are still going to be the big elephant in the room that's decided to take a crash on my couch. You're either going to love what they present, or you're going to loathe them for being too complicated. Personally, I don't mind them, but a more pressing issue will be the fact that this is not a game interested in the kind of build divergence seen in some other fantasy games. At least not in an overt sense, yet. I see a great deal of potential in Against the Dark Master for expansion and experimentation. All that said, I'd give Against the Dark Master a stamp of strongly recommended. This is a very high quality affair, all things considered, and I could see it getting a lot of use among tables that prefer a more retro affair over the more narrativist types. This is doubly so if you prefer your fantasy with a slice of cheese over blatant cynicism. Either way, it's about time we make criticals hurt again.